Hi everyone, welcome back to Emergency Chaos where we talk about tips and tricks for ER nurses. Today, we will be discussing what should be happening when a sick patient is on their way to the ER. So the main underlying purpose for doing this video is to ensure that as a new grad, you don't freeze and just stand around in the heat of the moment. There is always going to be something for you to do. So I hope that by watching this video, you learn the necessary things that need to happen beforehand and as the patient is coming in to the ER. So we will be talking about how to prepare prior to patient arrival, who is involved in their roles, the primary and secondary survey, and how to be proactive, not reactive. However, before we go on, we should briefly talk about what is the ER's job. The main role is to stabilize, figure out the cause, and to treat it, of course, there are many patients who will require extensive or long-term care that cannot be provided in a short ER visit and therefore will be admitted. For patients with lower acuity, connecting them with the appropriate resources is always a must. So now let's talk about getting ready for the patient. Essentially, EMS will give the hospital a heads up before arriving with the critical patient so that the appropriate staff is ready. This is very important for time sensitive issues like strokes and heart attacks, but extremely helpful when sick patients are en route. So you as the nurse for that patient can prepare beforehand. So as far as staff, you'll notify the respiratory therapist and your ER doctor. And at the same time, gather help like your fellow ER nurses and technicians. Once everyone is in the room, you'll assign roles to your ER nurses and techs. We'll discuss the roles in more detail on the next slides, but I want to highlight the importance of assigning roles because without you doing so, it will just be extremely chaotic and messy. Essentially, people will be running around without being efficient, so it is very important for you to assign roles before the patient arrives. After the correct people are notified, or simultaneously while you're notifying them, I want you to ensure that you have all the necessary supplies in the room and at hand ready to be used. These include your leads, your BP cuff, and your pulse ox so that the patient can be connected onto the cardiac monitor. You want your IV supplies ready. You want to have a BVM or bag valve mask ready and suction and a glucometer, pumps, and IV poles. And at the same time, having the crash cart and intubation equipment readily avail available in case it is needed. So let's talk about a brief uh, example of roles in a full arrest. So at the top, you're going to have the RT and a doctor who will handle the issues with the airway. Then one tech will perform CPR while another patient connects the patient onto the cardiac monitor. And our end will focus on obtaining IV access or IO access and give meds while another RN mans the crash cart and prepares the ACLS medications. You will be off to the side recording everything that happens in the room with your patient while at the same time helping coordinate care such as letting your provider know when it's time to administer another epi or to check a pulse. Then you'll have a team leader at the bottom who is in charge of making decisions for the patient. And then another example is, let's say that it's a, a trauma patient and not a full arrest. I'll be very similar to this, a very similar setup, just no one's gonna be doing CPR. And the provider at the top, after handling issues with the airway, will move down through the ABCs and communicate the findings to the team leader at the bottom who's making all uh, the care choices. So an important tip here is that there should only be one chef in the kitchen. So what do I mean by this? There should only be one team leader. You shouldn't have multiple providers in there giving different orders because it can be too, it can be very chaotic and sometimes these orders can be very contradicting. So there should only be one provider giving the orders at a time. And this just ensures that the flow of the end care is uh, much easier and efficient. So now let's talk about another issue. Let's say that you don't have an RT with you. Let's say that you don't have a tech with you. 
let's say that it's just you and the patient comes in and EMS is giving you a report. How does that go? So essentially, you're going to be listening and getting a report while at the same time connecting your patient onto the cardiac monitor, performing your assessments, providing treatments, obtaining IV access, and doing all of this at the same time without any help. And this can happen because the, the ER can get super full and resources can get very limited. Of course, if the resources are there and people are free when a sick patient is coming in, they will be there to help. But there are many times when it's just going to be you and the patient after receiving a report. So you're going to have to do a lot of the care by yourself. So that essentially includes placing the patient on the monitor uh, and getting everything ready. So ideally, the patient arrives, the patient is placed on the cardiac monitor and pulse oximeter, vital signs are obtained, IV access is established, blood work is sent to the lab, and while all of this is happening, at the same time, the assessment is being done and the appropriate interventions are being performed, or at least the planning and the setting up is being done, like for intubation, for chest tubes, for central lines, etc. So there's different methods out there, like the ABC versus the CAB. So ABC is airway, breathing, circulation, and then the CAB is circulation, airway, breathing. So the only difference for them is just, the, does the patient have a pulse? If the patient does not have a pulse, then you go with CAB and focus primarily on the circulation aspects, which means performing high quality CPR. But if the patient does have a pulse, then you go with the ABC, starting at the top with the airway. So for the purpose of this video, we're just going to focus on the patient does have a pulse and we're going to start with the ABCs. So now let's go straight into the airway. Let's divide it into assessment and interventions. So as far as assessment, it can be very simple. If the patient is speaking, then their airway is intact. Simple as that. However, another very important thing that you need to keep in mind is whether their airway will stay intact and if there's any possibility of airway compromise in the near future. Any possibility of airway compromise can call for intubation ahead of time before it does get compromised. Another thing is, if their mentation is decreased to the point where they can't handle their own airway, it can be a strong indicator to also intubate. So what do I mean by handle their own airway. If the patient began throwing up or having increased secretions, could they clear those secretions or vomit on their own without any assistance? If they can't do these, then it means they can't handle their own airway or protect their own airway. And it can also be an indication for intubation. Now, as far as assessing, let's look first. Do you see any edema or swelling to the lips or the tongue? any abnormalities to the neck or facial trauma. After this, let's listen. Can you hear any strider, gurgling or snoring? So meaning possible airway obstruction from secretions from the patient's own tongue or a foreign body. After listening, let's look inside. Is there any obvious foreign body, any visible blood or secretions, or does anything simply look abnormal to you? For interventions, at the top is intubation. Is their mentation so decreased that they need to be intubated as we discussed earlier? Or can you simply just do a head tilt, chin lift, or jaw thrust to open their airway, insert an OPA and MPA, which essentially ensures that there is opening for air movement and providing 100% oxygen via a bag valve mask. I'm gonna repeat that again. If you aren't going to intubate, you could also do a head tilt, chin lift, or jaw thrust, insert an OPA or NPA, and provide 100% FiO2 via BVM, which is also commonly done, okay? If when you look inside, talk about this, you see the secretions or vomit or blood, you need to clear it by suctioning it out. This goes back to how we discussed earlier how it is very important to have things ready beforehand, including suction. Because if you don't, it can delay care and essentially you'd be in trouble. 
when now let's talk about some important things when you administer 100 percent oxygen via uh, via the vbn it is important to know if the patient is taking their own spontaneous breaths because if they are then you simply just need to have the mask to their face so that they're getting the oxygen just like a non rebreather however if they're not taking their own spontaneous breaths then you need to do the c3 um procedure over their over their face over their nose and mouth with the bvm so you can provide breaths for them every five to six seconds another thing is to never perform any blind sweeps because you can push a foreign body back only do it if you only try to go for a foreign body if you can see it and can get it if not don't do any blind sweeps because you're going to push it further back and always maintain a c-spine uh, in place especially in traumas let's talk about opas for a little bit though uh, they, it keeps the tongue out of the way for blocking air movement. However, if the patient has a gag reflex, do not insert an OPA, insert an NPA through the nose because an OPA will induce them to vomit, creating a further, creating further issues. So an, so an NPA would be ideal in this situation. Okay, now let's talk about breathing. Is the patient actually breathing or are they apneic? Is their breathing adequate? Meaning, is it producing adequate ventilation that is leading to proper oxygenation? As far as the assessment, we need to overall look at the respiratory status of the patient. Is it easy and effortless or is it fast and labored? Is it deep and shallow or is it slow? Is there any accessory muscle use? So overall, you need to ask yourself, does it look like the patient is in respiratory distress? After this, we have to listen. It is important that you do not get wrapped up in the fine details of listening. You hear or simply listening for air movement bilaterally. If you pick up crackles, ronchies, wheezing, the finer details, then it's great. Please note though, that if a patient's respiratory effort is increased and labor, you can visibly see them struggling, but there is minimal air movement. When you listen to their lungs, you know that the patient is in trouble you need to act quickly meaning they are more sick also labor breathing takes up a lot of energy and it cannot be maintained so keep an eye out for a patient whose respiratory rate is dropping due to them tiring it out and going into respiratory failure and eventually arrest if you don't do anything as far as further assessment you need to check the chest and if they're breathing no, and if from their breathing, if you notice like any possible broken ribs, so you know, palpate the chest, he's at, see if anything uh, is out of the ordinary, and if you feel any broken ribs. Um, do you see any equal chest rise and fall? Do you know they flow chest or no movement on one side of the body or one side of the chest, which is which can indicate a, a for a pneumo? And then for interventions, we can simply go again, as we talked about earlier, administering 100% FiO2 via a non-rebreather or a BVM. Um, you can also go into a needle decompression or uh, placing a chest soup for a pneumo or hemothorax, uh, placing inclusive dressings for uh, sucking chest wounds, or if needed, going into intubation. So as far as circulation, there is one main, qu one main question that you need to ask yourself is the patient in shock so how do we determine this well first and foremost what is the patient's blood pressure which is why it is very important that you get your patient on the monitor as quickly as possible but there are other clues while the b while the patient is being connected onto the monitor that tells you if the patient uh, is possibly in shock some of these are skin color Another is palpating the quality of the pulses. Um, you can also note the cap refill and just looking for obvious signs of bleeding. And then as far as interventions for circulation, you need to uh, place an IV. Um, after you give it a few tries and it's been like a minute or so and you haven't been able to get IV access, getting IO access is definitely the next move. And then beginning fluid or blood administration depending on the likely cause of the shock. So depending on the cause of the shock, you may also be starting like vasopressors or heading straight to surgery uh, sooner than later. 
However, fluid, uh, fluids in the ER are the very uh, are the first line treatment for um, shock or a low blood pressure while in the ER. Okay, now let's talk about disability or neuro. In regards to the assessment, the gold standard is the GCS score. Essentially, it provides a standardized way of determining how alert a patient is, whether fully alert to comatose or somewhere in between, and it's generally and it's provided in a numerical form. We'll talk about a GCS scoring on another video. However, the main point is that a GCS less than eight, uh, you may have to consider intubation. Perhaps though, the most important thing is that you check a blood sugar to ensure that the patient symptoms are not simply related to hypoglycemia. So always for your ER patients who are comatose, check a blood sugar, or even if they are slightly altered and not speaking correctly or just seem a little off, check a blood sugar to rule out hypoglycemia. Then after you do these, the most important things are going to be checking the pupils, noting if they are pearl, pinpoint, or dilated, as it can help narrow a diagnosis. Remember that opioids can cause pinpoint pupils and different toxins may affect the eyes and therefore providing clues uh, for a diagnosis. We'll also talk about toxicology in the near future uh, video. Um, next, you should be assessing their sensation and motor function throughout their body. Are they speaking clearly? Are they oriented to person, time, situation, and location? As far in, as far as interventions when it comes to uh, disability or the nor portion of the ABCs, is uh, if the mentation is so uh, decreased, then you may have to intubate again. Speaking like uh, talking about earlier things, um, another thing would be Narcan. Narcan uh, can be administered, especially with pinpoint pupils and suspected uh, overdose. Getting also getting a CT can be helpful in determining if a patient has a head bleed or an ischemic injury, which depending on the results can mandate uh, things like a TPA or embolectomy or some type of shunt to control ICP or even drain blood. Uh, but most importantly, checking for blood sugar, administering Narcan if needed, intubating if a GCS is less than eight, and obtaining a CT scan of the head. As far as the environmental exposure uh, of the ABCDE, you have to expose your patient and look at everything to ensure that nothing was missed. This is very important, especially if you have no clues as far as to why your patient is this sick. Looking at everything, ensuring nothing is missed. And then and then uh, interventions, warming the patient is definitely a must unless they have a fever, so check that. And then decontaminate the patient, especially when uh, some type of toxin or toxicology is involved with this patient. Now let's uh, focus on the secondary assessment. We here are focusing on finding the cause, if not already known, and piecing clues together as far as why your patient is sick. We use a sample method because it kind of helps us guide our thinking to the appropriate questions to narrow down a diagnosis or finding a cause for the patient's sickness. So S stands for signs and symptoms, A for allergies, M for medications, P for past medical history, L last meal, and E event leading up to the current situation. So when you have your own patients, keep this at the back of your mind so that you don't forget anything. So signs and symptoms will guide you to a specific sy system of the body. So if they're having uh, abdominal upset, then you can kind of head that route versus shortness of breath, et cetera, et cetera. Think of allergies, think of medications. Did they just start a new medication? Did they take too much of their medication that they're normally on? Those type of questions can help you, uh, can guide you in the right direction. Uh, talk about past medical history. For, for example, do they have diabetes and they're taking insulin? Maybe they took too much insulin. Do they have high blood pressure and they took a little bit too much of their blood pressure? blood pressure medication, do they have, have they had any surgeries in the past? Uh, things like that. What was their last meal? What are the events leading up to the situation? Were they running and then they collapsed? Were, what were they doing essentially? And it's all gonna help with finding the cause of to, as to why the patient is sick. As far as the workup, there's a lot of things that can be ordered, but some of the simple stuff for your uh, ECG, your chest x-rays, your CTs, uh, simple blood work like your CBC, your BMP, 
your coax and then VBG and then ABG, uh, and then your analysis as well, looking for uh, looking for drugs uh, with their with their uh, urine toxin tox screen. Um, so that's going to be the simple stuff as far as the secondary assessment and the uh, workup. But we are going to do future videos on the workups on why certain tests are ordered. Uh, and for what reason versus other tests. So just keep an eye out for that in the future. And then I think this is also very important. And then I feel like I've talked about this before, but I can't stress it enough. In the ER, you need to be proactive and not reactive. So let's say that you already got your patient on the monitor um, and things are looking smooth, but what things can you start doing instead of just standing around, you know? So is the patient going to need fluids? Well, get some fluids, spike the bag, hang him, have him ready. Is the patient going to need vasopressors? It takes, if, if your Pixis doesn't have vasopressors pre-mixed for you, you can't simply just wait for the pharmacy to, to send them up. They are going to take a while. So you need to go mix your own vasopressors. So also learn how to mix them. Um, if they need blood, you need to get the trans the rapid transfuser and get the appropriate tubing for the rapid transfuser and start setting it up and getting prepared for blood to get to you and then giving it to the patient. If the patient is going to need intubation, what meds are you going to use for the intubation? Also, what meds, meds are you going to use for sedation after the fact? They're going to need an NG tube. They're going to need a Foley. They're going to need multiple IVs and perhaps soft restraints. So that if they do wake up for some reason, they don't self exhibit themselves. But you may not need the software sense, but more often than not, you will. Um, if they're going to be on CPAP or BiPAP, assist the RT, uh, position the patient, uh, gather the necessary supplies for the RT, you know, help everybody out. It's all a team. If they're going to need a chest tube, a central line or other interventions to gather the necessary supplies. A lot of these procedures are going to be placed by the providers. But you as the nurse need to know what supplies are needed. So while they're doing one thing, you get it ready for them and they can just move on to placing the chest soup or the central line. Again, as I said before, the more proactive you are in the beginning to stabilize and help stabilize your patient, the less work you are creating for yourself in the future. That is one way to think about it. Okay, so be proactive and it's less work in the future. And then if there's any life-saving meds that need to be given, start getting them ready. You know, no, think ahead of time. And even if paperwork, if you're just if you're just standing there, you can get start getting some of the paperwork done. You know, are we going to have to sign emergency consents, uh, any forms for putting in a central line, all that kind of stuff? If there's nothing else for you to do while the providers are doing this, the RT is doing that, and you have nothing else, then there's always going to be something to do. But if you can't think of anything, just start on paperwork because at some point in your day, you're also going to have to do that paperwork. So get ahead of it. And then also the great thing about working in the ER is that you can get verbal orders from your providers and just do things and then they'll put in the orders later on. So if you need to get a, a life-saving medication, you can just override it from your pixels or override it from wherever and give it and then your provider will put in the order uh, for you later. Okay, so now let's move on. I think the most important thing, and I keep saying this is the most important thing, but this is truly the most important thing, is that in the beginning, you just take a deep breath. You know what's coming in. You've prepared. Um, you take a deep breath, relax, calm yourself, and then take action. But take a deep breath. You know, I've seen a lot of uh, uh, nurses and providers uh, talk about a method where you take a deep breath in for four seconds, and then hold for four seconds and then exhale for four seconds and then kind of just calms you and then you can better focus on what's uh, in front of you and taking care of this patient. So um, before I move on though, just remember this is purely informational and educational. Please follow your own hospital's uh, policies and guidelines. And then as always in the ER, teamwork makes the dream work.